Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about what's happening news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of this show. Some of you know me for this other Beatles program that I host, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host in the show, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, and that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. I can. Uh, hello, everyone. Hope it's cool where you are, or cooler than it is here. It's, it's actually way. getting very warm where it's I getting, am. Yeah, and, it's starting to get really warm, and it is warm here today, where I am here today. So. And after this brutal winter, we're mm-hmm. welcoming it. <laughs> exactly. I'm not going to complain if we have 90-degree weather where I am in Connecticut. That's true. You guys had it really bad. So we didn't have it, obviously, so bad here, but it's it's hot today. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, on today's show, I thought that um, we would talk about this movie you might have heard of. It's called The Hard Day's Night. And the reason why we're bringing that up is because the movie has been remastered and uh, digitally restored. And it's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray. In fact, it's also going to be shown for a limited time around July 4th weekend in the United States. And so we thought that we should talk about this movie and its significance in Beatle history and perhaps even in, in the history of films. So my first question to you, Steve, would be, why is this movie in particular, apart from the fact that it's the Beatles, why is this movie so important? First of all, let me say that I saw the movie in the theater the second day it was released. I didn't mm. get to go the first day, but I did go the second day. And um, so I saw it on the big screen. I saw it uh, with a few screen. There were some screaming girls, although I understand that there were a lot more the first day than there were the second day. But, you know, one of the things about Hard Day's Night that's really interesting, if you look back on it now, is... It was kind of at the, it was near the tail end of the black and white era. There were still black and white films back then, but there were also, you know, color films too. And the the black and white, you know, film makes it retain its um, its uh, period look, you know. And and it really, if Hard Day's Night had been in color, I don't think it would have been as enjoyable and as, as as good as it is. That's interesting that you say that, because I always remember the late Roger Ebert, who raved about The Hard Day's Night. I think he even called it the best rock and roll film of all time, if I'm Mm -hmm. not mistaken. But he said the fact that it was in black and white has given it a timeless quality. Yeah, I have to agree with that, because it really... Well, actually, a timeless quality in a way, but it also gives it a period look. It makes it more... um, I don't know how you how you how you want to say this. As a, you know, as opposed to Help, which is in color, which looks more modern, it gives an, it gives it a, a classic feel. I think that's I don't want to say antiquated, but classic feel, and um, it's and it still has that. You know, not to mention the fact that the the acting is is really wonderful. Um, the opening scene, the train scene, has always been my favorite. I can watch that scene forever and ever. I love the way they interact. Even though there are moments, there are a couple of moments in there where there where the Beatles' um, amateur acting kind of shows through. I think the the one where Paul's face cringes when they talk about uh, grandfather, uh, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But for the most part, the the acting is just wonderful. It's really fantastic. The the writing is is stunning. You know, there's so many things uh, in there. Wolford Bramble's uh, acting as the grandfather is just classic. Mm-hmm. It's it's really it it actually American audiences for the most part didn't know who he was. The British audiences knew, but the American audiences didn't. And uh, you that, can say the same thing about uh, Norman Rossington, and you can say that about Victor Spinetti and John Junkin. Yeah, yeah. especially um, absolutely, and. Um, so yeah, that was um, you know that was pretty uh, pretty amazing uh, that there was so much there that uh, you know that people the American audiences didn't know uh, and uh, they found out rather quickly. So it was really it was really cool. Um, 
it's just a it, it is a classic movie and it's kind of gained a thanks to you know people like uh Roger Ebert and other uh, other many other reviewers who just gave it such a great review it's really gotten a, a lot of status and it, it really deserves it and it's great that it's being restored again there were a lot of criticism there was a lot of criticism in 2002 when the at the last restoration with the Miramax DVD of how that was handled. Uh, and a lot of it, I think some of the criticism was undeserved. I think a lot of the special features were really interesting. I thought even, so, too. Even though a lot of people criticized them, there was a lot of, you know, that was a lot of work to, to go into that. And I think, and you have to give credit to Martin Lewis for a lot of that, uh, for doing that. And, I especially loved there was there was um, a bonus feature there with with uh, interviews with many of the actors. Right. Some of them had small parts, but for example, the little boy that Ringo spent time with when mm-hmm. Ringo was playing hooky. It's just cool to see him on the screen reminiscing right. about that about right. that scene. Yeah, they dug up a them. lot of people for the Miramax uh, DVD. The problem with the Miramax DVD number one was the fact that it wasn't in stereo. And the other thing was the aspect ratio wasn't exactly what they had said it was going to be. But it's funny because I was doing some research and I was looking back and there were people that really loved it. And one of them is uh, Keith Badman, who everybody, Beatle, Beatle fans will know, did the, uh, has done extensive, uh, has done some great Beatle books on, you know, timeline books about uh, what the Beatles did after they broke up and during you know, when they were together. And he sent me a note back in 2002 saying he had seen an, an advanced copy of the, the DVD and he loved it. And I think a, a lot of the criticism maybe kind of snowballed from the from the sound pro, the sound thing. And as, you know, as has been said, and Martin Lewis said this to me in person and, you know, by email, the Beatles did not really own didn't wholly own a hard day's night then and so they didn't they weren't involved with the uh, the Miramax one and they still as my understanding is they still aren't even though Giles Martin is involved with the new version they are not directly involved now and and uh but you know we'll we'll see how this I'm I'm looking forward to seeing this not only because the movie deserves to be treated right but it's such a great movie so. Hmm. You just reminded me, and this is not meant to be a plug, but um, when the Miramax version came out, I had the thrill of interviewing Victor Spinetti along with Martin, and I placed a lot of that on my website to talk about that movie. So you might want to. I also know, just... I also interviewed Victor uh, by phone um, a couple of years ago, and it was one of the best interviews I have ever done. Uh huh. He was just absolutely a delight. He, I mean, I think he it was before he went to Beetlefest and before he went to the Fest for Beetlefans. And I think people have said he, to, he told a lot of the same stories over and over again, and I think he told a lot of them to me on the phone, and I used him in what I wrote up, but mm-hmm. it was still a, a wonderful interview. And I also, at the time of the DVD release, I went down to Hol- I was in Hollywood, and there was a screening of A Hard Day's Night at um, the Egyptian Theater, and I went to that and uh, met John Junkin there, and um, that was uh, that was a, that was wonderful. That was mm-hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. So, um, but in any event, I mean, that was a great. It's a great movie. There's no question about it. It's it's fantastic, and, it's, and I'm glad to see it come out again. But like I said, you know, it it has this aura of excellence, partially because I think of the black and white thing, but. It's just such a great movie. It really is. I also think that we should say that it really broke the mold for rock films. Right. And That's maybe right. whether it was intentional or not, it doesn't really matter. But most rock films before A Hard Day's Night were very formulaic. Right. You know, and it was always about rock and roll and there's going to be a dance in town. And it's going to corrupt the youths, <laughs> you know, in, in the neighborhood. And there's all this concern and you had the the top acts of the time coming in and doing a few of their songs. A lot of those movies were very much the same. Yeah, The Girl Can't Help It is one, Rock Around the Clock is another. 
Um, the Alan Freed movies, especially, uh, were very much that way. Yeah. Go Johnny Go was another one, and yeah, they're you know as fun as as fun as those are to watch now, um, and they are. Um, Hard Day's Night is definitely in a league by itself. It's it's really really fantastic. Well, I think that we should point out why, apart from the fact that the music is great and it's the Beatles and it's in black and white, what makes this such an outstanding film? And I think, for one thing, it should be considered important because, for many fans, it actually introduced us to the personalities of each of the Beatles. Because prior to this, unless you lived in England and you could hear the Beatles on BBC Radio, you didn't really get to hear interviews with them. You didn't really know what their personalities were like, what their characters were like. i I, I, I got to disagree with you there because there were... A lot of no, I shouldn't say a lot, but there were interview um, records sent to radio stations before Hard Day's Night with um, little clips of interviews, and some of them were were, were bootlegged. I remember seeing them floating around, and I think you can on some of the early bootleg CDs they've they're, they've actually been reproduced. Uh huh. Um, but there were interviews uh, floating around, and also kind of. You know, back, I mean, when on the Ed Sullivan show, you got to see, you know, the four of them, and they were all kind of personalized, you know, on the on the Ed Sullivan show. But you're right that that A Hard Day's Night definitely set up the four personalities, you know, John, George, Paul, and Ringo, John being the, uh, the, the wise guy. And he was really, I mean, there were some, there were some moments, and, and, I'm thinking specifically of the sniffing the Coke bottle uh-huh. that uh, really kind of flew pa- past the the adults uh, at that time, uh, and they they really did. There were some there were some classics in there. Um, the way he treated Victor Spinetti. The way, the way he treated Victor Spinetti, right? Um, that was and also Norm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, but it was it was all very outlined. Their different characters, and that that had to have been intentional. Oh, and yeah, it, uh, there was. It was definitely. The amazing thing, and you can't say this enough, and I know since the 80s, since I've been doing radio programs on the Beatles, and I've had Al Sussman as a guest many times, and he said this on our show, that the Beatles, apart from the great music, what makes them so different is that they're four very interesting personalities. You know, if this had been a film with just great music and very bland personalities, I don't know if he'd be talking about it right now. You know, yeah, I think it's uh, the fact Lester that definitely, Richard Lester definitely helped cement the the four personalities. I mean, he had, you know, Paul the real, you know, good looking. Well, I mean, Paul was real, you know, was considered the real good looking guy anyway. And they had the the whole "and I love her" thing, where with the camera going around and the the sunshine and everything like that. And they had George in the uh, the classic scene of George in the uh, in the office. Which uh-huh. is also one of my favorite. Talking about Susan, dead cruelty, and all that stuff. I mean, that was just absolutely that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, and and John larking about all through the movie, and and Ringo, of course, uh, being kind of the down and out guy, and kind of coming through there. So I mean, there were there was there was a little bit of you know for everybody, uh, you know, for, of each one of them, and they they all got. They all got their moment in the sun in that movie. And, uh, you know, they all had camera time. And yes, they all they made sure that each one of them had a particular scene. Although mm-hmm. the one that they planned with Paul didn't work out. But, um, you know, the, the the classic scene with George telling off the, the advertising executive and uh, John with, with the woman who's in the hallway with him and, you know, you look just like him and all this, you know, that, that uh, banter back and forth and... Ringo with the when he played hooky and mm-hmm. he's with the boy there on the lake. It really helped to give us a, t- a taste of what each of the four of them were like as people. Right. And I think for many of us, especially those of us who saw A Hard Day's Night before the other Beatle films, and that's not everybody, but for a lot of people that, that did see it in that order, the image that they have of the four of them was cemented from this movie. Oh, sure. Whether it's accurate or not but um like you said john being the the wise guy or or the witty one the sharp wit you know paul being the cute one george being not really quiet he certainly wasn't quiet in this movie but you know ringo the downtrodden one the one that always got in trouble 
You know, you know it, it was funny that after the movie, and it, it obviously didn't carry out that much, but as I recall, the one who, the Beatle who got the most attention for their acting in the movie was Ringo. Right. I mean, he, Ringo did act later, but um, it's interesting that Ringo of, of all, you know, I mean, you would have thought John definitely would have would have taken away the for all the stuff that he did. So, hmm. well, I think all of them except Paul, <laughs> I think had a natural quality in front of the camera. That's just my own opinion. Yeah, you that's a good point because Paul Paul does come off a couple of times as really kind of even though Paul's a, a natural personality, he sure doesn't have a problem in front of the camera now. In front of the Hard Day's Night camera, he did stumble a little bit as an as an actor. He was very self-conscious. Yeah. But so, um, you can apply this to the music as well as their appearance on screen. The Beatles made sure, like they hammered it into everybody's heads, it's John, Paul, George, and Ringo. If you look at their albums, almost all their albums have a George vocal, one or two songs. Uh, most of them, not all, but most of them have a Ringo vocal. They made sure in A Hard Day's Night that even though they were all Lennon McCartney songs that George sang, um, I'm happy just to dance with you. And even though Ringo didn't have a vocal, which is kind of ironic, in both A Hard Day's Night and Help, Ringo didn't have a vocal. Mm -hmm. But they still represented him by playing I Want to Be Your Man when they were dancing at the right. party that they went to. And even using This Boy, you know, which really they called it Ringo's theme. But somehow he's represented musically with songs, at least one song that he sang lead to. They always made sure that all four of them were represented somehow. It may not have been completely balanced, but that way attention was given to all four of them. And, um, you know, I've said this before on this show. I thought it was really brilliant in particular with, with A Hard Day's Night and Help that while Ringo always got less songs to sing, he was given the most attention in both those movies. Mm -hmm. And that had to have been deliberate, you know, so that all four of them received attention. Right. And that way it was more of a group effort. And if it wasn't for the fact that their personalities were just amazing, they're, they're fascinating people alone, and they're fascinating together. And when they interact, it's always very interesting. And you see that on the screen. Yeah. And the fact that you have that together with great music, that's what's made this film work so well. Right. As well as Help, as far as I'm concerned, because I love Help just as much, maybe even more than A Hard Day's Night. I'll see, I'm... I'm the other way, I think A Hard Day's Night is a better movie. Well, I but think I, A Hard I mean, Day's I still, Night... I still like Help a lot, but A Hard Day's Night is a better movie in, as far as I'm concerned. I think, um, you know, they're both great films. It's it's um, We can go back and forth on this, but A Hard Day's Night has a lot more dialogue and a lot more memorable lines from the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many Beatles fans can quote A Hard Day's Night in specific lines, as well as in Help, but A Hard Day's Night has had many more lines really classic lines uh, in that film. That's true. But um, there was a lot of innovation in A Hard Day's Night from Absolutely. Richard Lester. And Absolutely. in particular, the one thing, actually there's a couple of things that I would want to point out, and that is that it was a very fast-paced film. It was a whole bunch of real short scenes, and of course, playing the music at the same time. And I think that that, in many ways, I've heard it said that that did influence later films, and in particular television, I heard it said that, like, Laugh-In, a show like that, because that show was so, all the all the scenes, all the jokes, everything was very quick, 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 quick. A lot of that came from this kind of an influence. Well, the, the obvious the obvious thing that was influenced by Hard Day's Night was uh, the monkeys. Uh, right. The, the, the whole monkey series was basically a Hard Day's Night from week to week, you know, the way they, the way they did all those, those crazy, you know, crazy things and you know the the chase scene, the inevitable chase scene every week and stuff and things like that, and mm -hmm. the way the music was was used, that was all hard day's night, definitely. Yeah, but the fact that so many scenes were very quick, it kept you glued. Mm -hmm. You were never bored. There was never a scene where it, it ran too long. So as soon as you're done with one scene, you're on to the next. And the other thing is, and it's kind of ironic to show how much ahead of his time Richard Lester was. When MTV started, and they were showing clips from A Hard Day's Night, as well as 
as help. And you can also do this, and they have done it with Yellow Submarine. I'm not sure about Let It Be. But when you just take the music scenes, when they're doing certain songs, they work as videos. Right. I mean, there are the performance videos where they're just in front of a camera and they're miming to the record. There's always those. But if you take uh, the two scenes in A Hard Day's Night where A Can't Buy Me Love happens, when that's featured, those are really great videos to themselves, oh, yeah. separate from everything else. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot in A Hard Day's Night like that. Just the whole bit about the Beatles running up to the police station to rescue Ringo, mm-hmm. to take Ringo out of there. Then they go out of the police station. They run down the steps. They go down the street. They go back to the police station. That's just, it's amazing how well that works, especially to the song. That's all Keystone Cops stuff you hmm. know, redone, and, and it, but it works, out, it works great. It really does. You just reminded me of something because uh, I'm thinking of, you mentioned Keystone Cops, but Slapstick being mm-hmm. in, in the movie, the whole scene where uh, Ringo is, is helping a woman out when she's walking over, you know, a muddy area, right. you know, and, and he lays his coat down, and then she falls into the <laughs> into the hole there. Right. I mean, to me, that's very slapstick. That's, and that's, when John's in the bathtub, uh, that kind of, that's a, not, maybe not so much, but yeah, that's another, that's another instance where, you know, there was a little bit of slapstick too. Not just slapstick, but also surrealism. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. that's one of the things. As a little kid, I was baffled when I watched The Hard Day's Night because certain things just seemed impossible to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, when when uh, <clears throat> the first scene when when they're confronting the older man in the the train compartment, and then later they're outside the train running, you know, to catch the train, which which is impossible to do. <laughs> you can't run and catch a train at the same time. But um, you know that kind of thing, and also um, the scene in the cafeteria when Ringo's talking to his grandfather and there's a guy there who's ha- who's having a meal and he has a cast on his arm and he's putting ketchup on it. Right. You know, that kind of thing. It's really, you know, for a little kid, that's pretty strange to watch, but those moments of surrealism, very inventive. Yeah. No, there, there's, there's some great, there's some great stuff all the way through that movie. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's great that they're bringing it back and keeping it revived for, for new generations, because a lot of people will probably have not seen this, and will be seeing it for the first time. So yeah, that's very cool. Hmm. So I wanted to mention a couple of uh, the DVD, and you know, for those people that are on the fence about buying it, um, what it's going to have? It's going to be basically a combination of features from the original MPI home video version, and the new video, the uh, Miramax version, and plus new features. And the only way you're going to get all the new features is to get the dual format disc with the Blu-ray and the regular DVD. They're putting it out, putting it out as as a regular DVD and a Blu-ray and a regular DVD. And the only way to get everything is to buy the Blu-ray, the Blu-ray uh, dual format uh, regular DVD. If that makes a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. But they're going to—they've restored the picture approved by Richard Lester with three audio options with a mono sound ter- uh, soundtrack, a newly created stereo soundtrack, which I'm sure people are cheering for because there hasn't been one since MPI, and a five-one surround mix. And these were all done by Giles Martin. And on the Blu-ray, it's going to be uncompressed mono, uncompressed stereo, and DTS HD master audio on uh, on the Blu-ray. So hmm. that's. You know, that's another reason to get a Blu-ray player if you don't have one. There's going to be uh, audio commentary on the on the dual format with the cast and crew. It doesn't say Beatles. It says cast and crew. There's going to be a new um, there's going to be a new featurette called In Their Own Voices with vintage uh, 64 interviews with the Beatles and behind the scenes footage and photos. And uh, it doesn't look like from the description on these special features that the Beatles have added anything new now, which is kind of not surprising, but maybe it's best that way, because, you know, because this is 64. But hmm. in any it, event, There um, are advantages and disadvantages of both. Right. You know, they're going to have... gonna, uh, include You Can't Do That, The Making of a Hard Day's Night, with the, with the footage of You Can't Do That that wasn't in the movie. They're going to have Things They Said Today, the 2002 documentary... 
with all the interviews of people uh, involved in the movie from the Miramax DVD. They're going to have a uh, picture-wise a, a new documentary about Richard Luster. They're going to have the Running, Jumping, Standing Still film, which was on the MPI DVD. Mm-hmm. They're going to have Anatomy of a Style, uh, also about Richard Luster. They're going to have an interview with Mark Lewison, uh, also on the dual format. Both of those, the Anatomy of Style and the interview with Mark Lewison, are on the dual format. And there's also going to be an, an excerpt from uh, critic Howard Hampton and a, a, a vintage 1970 interview with Lester, again, on the dual format. So there's really a lot of reason to get the dual format if you spend the, a little extra money and get the, the dual format, even if you don't have a Blu-ray. I'm not positive if all the features will be available to DVD, but, but everybody everybody seems to think they will be, that the the DVD version in the dual format will have all the all the features. So... There you go. Hmm. I'm glad to see a lot of attention being given to Richard Lester. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it makes you aware of just how inventive and innovative he was in this particular film. And um, what is the release date now? Because the last I heard was June 24th. Yeah, June 24th. Okay. So, there you go. It's a, just about a month away. Well, I'm looking forward to this and also seeing it on the big screen, which is always a thrill. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that too. Um it's it's so much fun. I've I've seen it I can't ima- I can't even remember how many times I've seen it on the big screen between 64 and now. Um I mean I I do remember seeing it I believe it was in the uh, 70s or 80s um when it came back the first time. Unfortunately, and I can't remember what year it was in San Jose, which is relatively close to where I am. Walter Shenson was at the screening, and I unfortunately did not go to that. I wish I had now, but um, anyway. So, mm. And I, I feel uh, pretty fortunate. Not only have I interviewed Victor, but I also interviewed Norman Rossington and John Junkin oh, and wow. Walter Shenson. And um, some of that's on my website now. So oh, I'll have cool. to go and, and dig up the ones that aren't on the website. <laughs> Rossington in, in particular was a, a very... Veteran who was a very extensive had done a lot of acting in the UK. Right. Very, very well known British actor. Mm-hmm. Um in fact actually the other day I was watching The Avengers, the Emma Peel John Steed show. Right. And John Junkin was in that. Mm-hmm. In fact, yeah, because I kinda of looked and they went, That's John Junkin, oh my god. So they both I mean they were both you know, very well-known actors. Uh, they both had extensive credits, and um, so it's kind of interesting that they picked mainly British actors. I mean, which would which would be suitable anyway, since they were playing at a British theater at the time. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, the fact that they didn't use anybody that were more worldwide famous, it made you focus more on the Beatles. Which you would have done anyway. I'm sure. I think that was probably that was a good move. I think on. Um, on their part. And also, it, it was a low-budget film. It cost mm-hmm. only $500,000. And uh, it's one of the, the many miracles of the history of the Beatles because, as I've said a number of times, nobody knows when they create music or art of any kind how long it's going to last. And certainly when the Beatles broke big in the very beginning, I'm sure they weren't thinking, hey, we're going to be movie stars too. But... They were asked to make this movie to cash in on their fame at the moment because they, you know, the, the people at United Artists, they, they probably felt that they were going to be a flash in the pan. Let's make money now while we can. And who would have thought that 50 years later we'd still be watching this movie and enjoying it just as much as we ever did? As I recall, they had actually, there was talk about the movie even before they came over here. That's right. So it, it, was, in, it was in the works before the Sullivan show and although I mean obviously they didn't have it done but they you know there had been they had been talking about it so um, which is really interesting in a way mm -hmm. the fact that they were approached before they broke big in America right and imagine how it would have went over if they had not been as big in America as they were that would have been that would have been interesting Mm -hmm. would have been very interesting I think it still would have gone over pretty well but obviously, their impact, their worldwide impact, did did play a role. 
So. But uh, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to seeing this in the theater and getting yep. the DVD. Yeah, it's, I'm glad. Again, you know, it's great that they're that they're doing this. You know, the only you realize now that with this one coming back out, the only one left, the only film left now is Let It Be. Well, so, <laughs> you know, mean? you know, it's it's kind of interesting. We'll close with this, but um, Rolling Stone magazine just put out an article. I don't know if you saw this. Yes, I did. Of the six most sought after out of print Beatles releases. And yeah, and I, and I I did think that was interesting that most of the things that they mentioned had never been in legal print. I, you know, I don't know where they came up with that out of print stuff. That's because, true, like a video collection. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and, and that stuff hasn't been in legal print yet, but um, yeah, let they it be did was number one. Let it be, and, let it be uh, was number one. Yeah. And, and understandable, most understandable. obvious. <laughs> I think I think we're getting to the point where it's. Undeniable that they that they can't leave it out. So, I hope you're right. I I think so. I I think they're, you know, as the years go on, I think there's, and I, I mean, I, I I can't imagine. Well, I can't imagine who's holding it back. And but I think as years go on, it's gonna, the the noise is going to get louder and louder, and people are finally going to say, "Come on, let it go." You know, it's we're not going to care. Well, I think I'll leave everybody wondering who you're thinking of when you just said that. But, uh, everyone, I think the answer is pretty obvious. The, everybody, the, write to Steve. Yeah, write at our to me. Email write address. to me, and and for the and guess who I'm talking about. But I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's not person, obvious to me. The rumor, the rumored person who most supposedly was the most uh, resistant to releasing it. I think that uh, that tells the story right there. Okay. I've also heard Paul say something recently where he said there was a lot of red tape involved, so that could be holding that back. I, I know. think, you know, I, that I think is a – I'm not sure I believe that. I don't see what the red tape is. It's their music. It's, you know, they did all the I, – I can't see what the red tape is unless it's the, the studio that they filmed it in or studios. I, I, you know, I don't see I don't see how that is a problem. I don't know. I really don't. Um, I only know Paul said it. So Right. So anyway, if any of you would like to write to us, the easy way to do so, especially if you want to hound Steve with that question, is <laughs> to write you. to Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail dot com. Yep. You can also get in touch with Steve on Facebook. We also have our own Facebook page at Things We Said Today. And please like us. We need please, to get as many please. We also have a group we have a regular page and a group page and so join in join in tell tell us what you think we want to hear yell at us scream at us i don't know Mm -hmm. whatever you want to do we want passion that's true it doesn't matter if you agree with us or not you know as long as you care enough to listen and you want to chime in on what we're talking about we welcome that yep and um if you want to get in touch with me my direct email address is every little thing at att.net and by all means, please check out my own website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles, including a brand new interview with Lawrence Juber. And in fact, uh, there'll be another one coming soon with Steve Holly. So those of you who love uh, the end of the Wings period will certainly enjoy that. And uh, once again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And all you right. can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com or on Facebook. God, I'm, I'm I'm so many places. It's ridiculous. Um, He's everywhere. Um, yeah, just about seems like. Uh, but anyway, Beatles Examiner Gmail dot com would love to hear from you. Okay, so thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Ken Michaels for things we said today, and I will see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for things we said today. Stay cool, and we will see you next time. <laughs>